Welcome uh, everyone to this third panel of the conference Sapiens and Trans Healing Cooperation and Imagination. This panel is on spiritual healing, trans and mental health. So um, we have some uh, uh, speakers who are here in person with us and uh, some online. Uh, I will go straight to the first speaker. So you will have 20 minutes each and then at the end we'll have uh, a debate. So let me introduce you, uh, Ursula Reed from uh, Warwick University, uh, and uh, she's presenting a project along with uh, Erminia Colucci, Middlesex University, Diana Sati Setiavati, Universitas Gajamada, uh, Indonesia, and Lili Kpobi, uh, University of Ghana. Uh, the paper is Playing with Spirits, Exploring the Interpretive Space of Spirit Possession Through Ethnographic Film in Ghana and Indonesia. I'm following um, Ursula's presentation, uh, we will also watch a, a short film uh, from this project um, that uh, was made by uh, Erminia Colucci. Thank, thanks, Emily. Thank you very much for, for inviting um, uh, yeah, organizing this conference and inviting us to be part. Uh, it's really been fascinating so far, so I hope I can contribute to some of the um, very interesting discussions we've had so far. So um, the short film that we're going to show after my presentation is, is called Between Two Worlds. And it was developed um, from the, the footage that Herminia uh, filmed in Ghana and in Indonesia in 2019 as part of our Together for Mental Health project, um, which Herminia will, will talk more about tomorrow. Um, and the film was edited by Nadia Astari from Indonesia, and she's put together footage from these two settings. So it's quite an interesting kind of experiment in comparison of possession states in these two uh, quite different settings, but also uh, I hope, as you'll see, there are some interesting uh, points of comparison. Um, so our research for the Together for Mental Health project, just in brief, it aimed to explore how mental health workers attempt to collaborate with healers with the aim to improve access to biomedical treatment and prevent harmful practices such as chaining and confinement, which are big concerns in both countries. So filming in Ghana was conducted first in the Bono East region, um, and the, I've been conducting research there for quite a number of years, first for my uh, master's and then my PhD, and, and then I sort of uh, continually pretty much up to the present. And community mental health care has recently expanded in this area with the, op with the opening of mental health centres or mental health kind of um, sub-centres within primary health care clinics. And the healers involved in Ghana were Pentecostal past pastors who offered healing through fasting and prayers and deliverance from evil spirits. And then so-called traditional healers, which uh, is a bit of a misnomer, but they're, they're, they're known uh, locally in Chui as a comfort, and they use divination, animal sacrifice, and plant-based medicines as their primary uh, methods of healing. And in Indonesia, which I, I, I don't know very well, I've never been there, so, uh, but Arminia has done a lot of work there, and Diana, who's, who's hopefully online, uh, works at Universitas Gajamada, as uh, Emily was explaining. The filming there took place in various regions and uh, explored the practices of Catholic, um, Hindu, uh, and Islamic forms of healing. In, and that included also deliverance from spirits and, and jinn, which are, those of you who are familiar with Islamic healing, are, are mentioned in the Quran. So in this pre presentation, I'm going to draw primarily on my ethno ethnographic familiarity with Ghana, including field notes that, I'm, that, that, are, that I've made over the years and, and for this project, and the filmed interviews that um, Aminia, Lily, and I uh, did in Ghana. Um, but I, I will make a bit of reference to Indonesia, uh, but uh, Diana is hopefully online be able to answer any questions in relation to, to what you see from Indonesia in the film and, and, and Armenia too. So in both Ghana and Indonesia, madness is commonly believed to be a consequence of possession, whether by demons within the Pentecostal churches in Ghana, spirits, so the English word interestingly quite often used even when people are speaking Chui, Abosom, which are kind of small gods in tree in Ghana, and Quranic jinn, which inhabit both countries since Ghana has a 30% roughly Islamic 
uh, population and and of course Indonesia has the biggest Muslim population uh, in the world I believe. So though much has been discussed around these varying cosmologies, in practice, in Ghana at least, these spirit domains are very fluid. Uh, Birgit Mayer in a famous paper, uh, well, book, wrote like, if you are a witch, you are a devil. So these kind, they're kind of used interchangeably. And indeed in the Akan speaking of area of Ghana where we conducted the filming, the English word spirits, the Twi Bonsam, which is translated into English as the devil, these little dwarf, uh, which are called um, motia in Chui and Hongfi, so evil spirits, are all used quite interchangeably to describe a landscape animated by beings whose effects are felt but are only visible to those with the eyes to see or four eyes, as they would say, so with spiritual insight. And as we discussed yesterday, and you'll shortly see in the film, such spirits become visible at the point of exorcism or deliverance as bodies shake, twist and spin, people scream and groan, and imams and pastors call for the spirit to leave in the name of Jesus in the Christian church or through the words of the Quran. In Ghana, however, as you'll see in the opening scene to the film, spirits not only visit the person seeking healing, but also seize the body of the healer. A comfort means literally a person who is possessed. Com is the, is the, the, the verb to, for, to be possessed. It is the spirit who directs the akompo to divine the nature and cause of the illness and guides him to the plants which he'll turn into medicines. So first slide, please. So this is Nana Munufie. Oh, it's not Nana Munufie. <laughs> yeah. So this is Nana Munufie in, in France, as you, you see. Um, uh, Nana Munufie, um, uh, sorry, yes. Nana Munufie took over from his uncle Nana Kwame Afori, who I met when I was doing my PhD research in 2007, 2008, and he unfortunately died shortly after. Next slide, please. Oh, sorry, if you could just go back to the previous slide. Yeah, on this slide, you'll see that, you know, it's very famous for um, uh, the sign boy says in tree, like stopping madness, healing madness and other, other problems. So, um, so, you know, he's very well known and he has put this sign board up that appeared after I'd finished my PhD research. So yeah, the next slide, please. So um, this is Nana Kwame Afori, uh, who had, uh, he, he, he died shortly after this picture was taken. He'd actually had his leg amputated. So in order to dance <coughs> and spirits possessed him, he had to be lifted onto the shoulders of the men at the shrine, which I thought was a really interesting uh, kind of variation on the, the form of, of, of the dance. And uh, this uh, is them making the, the, the herbal, the plant-based medicines, which they, they mix together uh, and grind on the stones. And as you see in the quote, um, uh, um, Nana Munufie, we saw in the previous picture, the, 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 the man who has inherited the, 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 the role of running this very well-known shrine for healing madness, he, he described how uh, the, the, the spirit took uh, Kwame Afore, the man here, and it took him into the bus, the bush, sorry, and he spent about seven days, seven to 10 days there before it brought him home. And when he and while he was in the the jungle, the bush, the forest, uh, the, the 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 spirit showed him the medicines, the plants that he needed to use to make this medicine, and that is what is used up till now to, for the treatment of people with serious mental illness. And this shrine, which is called Fawal Mine, seize your 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 land, um, is is one of the most famous shrines in the region, if not in Ghana, actually, for the treatment of of madness. And so this initiatory possession is very typical of the calling to work as an accomplice, as this form of healer. Um, so in this spirit saturated world, mental health workers view their task as educating and enlightening their patients. So these are these mental health workers who are now sort of being sent out to work in, in, in many uh, towns and villages across Ghana. So they see their job as challenging these superstitious beliefs and replacing them with a modern and scientific interpretation. So witness, for example, this conversation between a queer, a woman who was being treated for what appeared to be epilepsy, and a nurse, Abigail, who we filmed in conversation. Abigail and the nurses that she worked with had repeatedly attempted to convince a queer not to use healers, as some members of her family advised, and to stick to the medicines they had prescribed. So a queer described to Abigail her experience of sickness as possession. She said, when it comes, it's like, the, it's like you are there as we are seated here and a big snake has come out. You will get up and run because you're afraid. You will run. So the thing, so she's talking about the, the kind of 
madness does. When it, when it is in front, my soul doesn't like it, so I don't take it. So when it happens that way, I become strong. As I'm sitting here now, I'm strong. When I go to church and I'm praying and they call sick people to come, and when the power comes, all the elders will come and hold on to me. They can't stand it. They struggle with me a lot. I struggle too. I soil myself. The strength, I become strong, then I become weak. So every time I get ill, I become weak the next day. So then Abigail replied, the reason why when the illness comes, you become weak, weak, we explained all of that to you. What causes the illness? It may not be any fault of yours. Someone who the last time we told you that someone could have an accident, he may have hit his head and maybe that was what caused the illness. It isn't any fault of his. So now you must believe that. Don't let anyone tell you that it's witchcraft or that a spirit has possessed you and made you so strong. You see, you said yourself that afterwards you become weak. Yes, that's how the illness is, because when it comes, it takes over your whole body. You don't have any control over your body. So you can see that after it's gone, you lie down quietly and you've become weak. So Abigail's emphasis is on the illness as an accident, whether a literal one being hit on the head or a metaphorical one. It just happened. Whereas spirit possession and witchcraft suggest a moral misdemeanor on the part of the patient or evil intentions on the part of another. The by a medical message is sold as removing blame from the person. It may not be any fault of yours, as Abigail says. The person has no control over her body. The illness just comes. However, though this blameless view of mental illness, it is embraced by some people because it, it means it's not their fault. There's nothing they could have done about it. It's not due to them using witchcraft. It's not, used to them, it's not due to them doing something immoral. For some like Equia, the middle medical model alone was unsatisfactory. Healers remain very popular, even as mental health care expands, and even when psychotropic medication is acknowledged to have some powerful effects in calming the most troublesome manifestations of madness. So whilst this enduring popularity of healers can be attributed in part to issues of access and relative cost, especially where the current fragility in the health system works kind of chronic of fragility really leads to out-of-pocket costs. So people are paying for medication even when it should be free. There are other factors at play. It's not just down to accessibility and cost. There's also the effect of, of the psychotropic medication on the, on the body. It, it makes people drowsy, it makes them feel weak, and people complain quite commonly about that. And it also, psychotropic medicine isn't a cure. So one father told us, if a doctor gives you medicine, which you take, and your illness goes away, but later comes back, then you're not healed. Maybe he just reduced it a little bit. The medical explanations offered by the nurses, this isn't witchcraft, it's a disease, or it's not possession, it's a disease, exist within what uh, the philosopher Charles Taylor describes in a secular age as the closed, imminent frame. And I'm very grateful to my philosopher colleague, um, uh, Camelia Kong, for introducing me to Charles Taylor's work. In the imminent frame, experience is reduced to what can be explained through the natural laws of the material world. Rather than a porous self, open to spirits, the self is buffered, closed off from experiences of participation and transcendence and to other ways of being and knowing beyond the material. As argued by Mohammed Rashid in his 2020 paper, possession, on the other hand, opens up a much wider interpretive, experiential and social space. Janice Body writes that possession widens out from the body and self into other domains of knowledge and experience, other lives, societies, historical moments, levels of cosmos and religions, catching these up and embodying them. As Rashid explains, spirit possession can't be reduced to explanatory theory as popularized in the uptake of Kleinman's concept of explanatory models. Indeed, in my experience, explanation is often deliberately vague, propositional and ambiguous. Rather, possession informs people's understanding of themselves and others in such domains as agency, responsibility, identity, normality, and morality, as Rashid writes. It is, above all, as we discussed yesterday, primarily a social as well as a spiritual experience. Playing with spirits, as, we see in the, as we'll see in the film, enables people to imagine and experiment with other ways of being, feeling, and acting. The person is given the freedom to tr transcend normative social conventions and become other to themselves and to those around them. So as, as, as we'll see, the possession experiences can open up a world in varied ways. 
The first allies to what, allies to what Deleuze and Guattari in Anti-Oedipus describe as becoming animal. As you will see in the film, possession states may manifest as stylized animal postures, such as crawling on all fours or writhing like a snake. The person experiences themselves not as sealed off from nature, but as an animal in the animal kingdom, as part of nature, as part of the bush, the wild. A queer describes a feeling of animalistic supernatural strength, often described by people who've been possessed. Entering the forest during one of her seizures, she encountered a hunter who mistook her for an animal and attempted to shoot her. So she said, by the time I became conscious of myself, I was in the bush. I hadn't been in the town for a long time. I didn't know how to get to the town. Luckily, I met a hunter. So I was there and I heard a voice approaching and I met the person. Immediately I spoke, I heard a boom sound. I think she was referring to a gun. And I said, I am human, oh, I'm a, I'm a human being. I beg you, I'm a human and I'm a visitor. They didn't rescue me. Another person came and I said, Papa, please, I'm a human and I'm from Ankranza. This town is called Nyami Becheri and I've been asked to come for medicine, uh, for healing, she means. But I don't know where I am. I don't know this forest. I haven't been to a forest before. I have a farm. I have this illness. And when I became conscious, when my eyes were opened, I was in the bush. I don't know what's ahead. I don't know what's behind. So if you can take me somewhere, so that when day breaks, you can show me how to get back to that, ta that town. So he held my hand and he brought me home. When seized by the spirit, so going mad, whether this results in a call to healing, uh, as we saw with the uh, Nana uh, Munufia and Nana Kwame Afore, or the onset of illness, people commonly describe being compelled to rush from the domesticated kind of social safety of the town or the village into the bush, this untamed forest or, or, or grasslands. And the forest is recognized as dangerous, but also powerful. It's, it's wild, it's hot, it's, 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 it's opposed to the cool, uh, calm and controlled uh, social spaces of, of the town. The natural world is the source of potent plants with healing potentials. It's the home to totemic animals and spirits, such as the, the motia, these little dwarves, which are supposed to live in, in the forest. And so Nana Duadu told uh, another, um, a compo, told us how he, he'd got his medication from the bush. It wasn't white man's medicine, uh, and it was from the trees that God gave to us. It's part of nature. So as Deleuze and Guattari suggest, um, this is a place of, of boundary crossing, of bordering, of becoming, of alterity, and Heimlich, the, the uncanny experiences, which don't need to be pathologized as abnormal, because actually rushing out into the forest is the normal manifestation of madness, but they're not mundane. So in Deleuze and Guattari's words, they're kind of anomalous as opposed to abnormal. Indeed, such experiences may be intensely out of the ordinary, ecstatic and pleasurable as we talk, were talking about this morning. Possession in the film is play, it's entertainment, and it, it evokes kind of feelings of fear, excitement, and as we were discussing yesterday, hilarity, amusement. So Rashid argues that the spirit stance, as he calls it, enables the preservation of some intentionality. And I think this is one of the big you know, debates of this conference. Um, and it, it, it gives some intentionality for inappropriate and incomprehensible behavior. So keeping open the question of intentionality means that the person might not just be a victim of disorder over which they have no control as, as the nurse was, was framing it. Within possession madness, it's not just senseless disorder, as implied in, in, in common terms used in Ghana, like basa basa, it's like disorder, chaos, kind of nonsense, or say, which is like someone is spoiled, useless, rotten, but it's a socially, socially and culturally meaningful experience. To be, to be possessed is thus a means to engage through the body with the wild, the untamed, the antinomian. Possession states enable transgressive behaviors, so, Next slide, actually, sorry, a long time on to the next slide, such as smoking. So this, I took this in 2008. It was like a big uh, uh, coming together of, of different uh, acom for, for this ceremony, 40-day uh, ceremony. Um, so they smoke. I mean, smoking is really frowned on in, in Ghana, way more than um, it would be in, in the UK, for example. Taking off your clothes, drinking to excess, all of these can kind of be permitted within the space of, of, of possession states. And they're, they're permitted because the person has literally lost their mind. They are not committing the action, but the spirit possessing them. So it's not this woman in red smoking, it's the spirit who is smoking. 
And for a woman to smoke as well is, equal, is another layer of transgression. So this is rather different to a pathological loss of control. The person is not, as I was saying yesterday, lost irrevocably uh, or, or spoiled in the sense of being wasted and useless, but under the influence of a spirit expressing themselves through him or her. This is a temporal state which opens up the poss possibility of either entering a relationship with the spirits, as we saw with the nanas, or uh, to make use of their powers for, for healing, or getting rid of the spirit, as in the case of uh, you know, exercising jinn or, or, or spirits, as, as, um, as Tom Sawdust was talking about yesterday. So, um, just making sure, yeah, I'm nearly getting there. So, on the other hand, so as opposed to this kind of deterritorializing uh, becoming that Deleuze and Guattari describe, psychiatric diagnoses aim to fix and stabilize experience. Indeed, the need to stabilize the condition through drugs is one of the key terms used by, by nurses in Ghana. The attempt to fix a queer's experience as just an illness like any other closes down the freedom of varied interpretations and alternatives for action. And so, as Cecilia Derecho's research also shows, this, this interpretation, this medical interpretation, may be resisted or questioned. As described by this Islamic healer in Indonesia, substituting jinn with psychiatric diagnoses renders the experience meaningless and removes the possibility of deliverance and healing. So he said that the challenge is when I say the disorder is caused by jinn, but the psychologists won't acknowledge the jinn, they would say it's multiple personality disorder or hysteria. And that to him is unsatisfactory. So I want to just close with uh, just a very, very, very brief uh, uh, vignette about James, who I am, we met at the church of a female pastor in Twobadon. Um, and that's in the area where we were doing the filming. And he had experienced what seemed to be a form of psychotic breakdown. And he'd eventually come to live with this pastor brought by his family, who became his spiritual mother. She prayed for him, paid for him to complete his schooling and helped him to train as a tyler. So it wasn't just about deliverance or, or he, it was also about restoring him to a social role. James described his illness in ways which resonate with the classic possession experience. I think, uh, next slide, please, sorry. I have a picture. Oh, I'll skip this lady. I'll try. Yes, uh, sorry, keep going. That's the mental health nurses. Yes, so this is James, yes. So James at the church, and then uh, he's given us permission to disclose his, his, his name and identity. So this is him uh, when we were doing the filming, and then this is him more recently in um, April this year. So we, this is 2019, this is April. And so he said, after a while, um, he talked about how he got lost in the bush. So he said, after a while, the more the prayers were going on, the more severe one came. So I even left here, the church, left the church premises. And for about a week, I haven't come back home. I was roaming about in the bush, some bushes somewhere. So you can see it's very similar to Equia and to the Gila. Eventually, James was found by a church brother and returned to the pastor where he was eventually healed. For James, there were many possibilities for what could cause the madness, whether spirits or what he called physical causes, such as drugs or alcohol, which could impede the healing process. So he said, the situation that we call madness is something that you, the person, is part of. And the spirit, spiritually too, maybe a spirit is also after you. That's also part of it. But the physical one, what I have experienced is that the things we drink, the drugs and alcohol and some other things affect the person's body. I know that's also part of the problems. For me, I was young, I was a child, I was born in a Christian home, but I was stubborn. I wasn't raised to take drugs or alcohol or cigarettes. Yes, I know that is part of why God stretched his hands over me and I got healing in my body without any effect. So at this national dialogue, which is where this picture is taken, uh, which was on non-communicable diseases and at the University of Ghana, and we invited James and the pastor is the lady in the red hat. We invited them to come uh, to the screening of Unkabom, our film. And James stood up to share his experience with the assembled audience of doctors, nurses, mental health advocates and researchers. I was mad, he said, and I was healed. Afterwards, a couple of the young mental health advocates came to remonstrate with him and they also have uh, a serious mental illness. They said, don't say you're mad, they urged him. You have psychosocial disabilities. Trained by British anti-stigma campaigners, they'd been taught to replace the language of madness and spirits with the language of disability rights. While there is an undeniable need to challenge practices of social exclusion, we could also ask what might, what might be lost in getting rid of the creative imaginaries, embodied language, and embodied language of madness and possession, which are shown in our film. 
As articulated by Cecilia, another mental health advocate at the end of the meeting, it's not just about the medications, it's about being at peace with ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you. So we can share the oh the film. <laughs> so I put it on the desktop. Okay. So now we're gonna watch a short film uh, between the two words possession and healing in Ghana and Indonesia, uh, just released by Erminia Colucci. Yeah. So I put it on the yeah. yeah, it is a preview. <laughs> Do you want to come here, Erminia? Oh, you're the filmmaker, right? <laughs> you can come here. In order to share. Yeah. Oh, I think it's in Oh, the yeah. Oh, the
This is the small shelter that we are building for for that lady. The shelter will be safe, conducive for her. Kalau itu sudah selesai, kamu tinggal di situ. Ini dikasih keluar, makan ubi bersama. Thank you, Ursula. Thank you, Minia and Diana and Lily for uh, uh, this uh, presentation and this preview of this video, this film. And I invite you all tomorrow to the visual uh, ethnography uh, workshop where um, the film by um, Erminia Colucci will be screened, Harmony Healing Together. It's fascinating some of the scenes were shown in just a position here from uh, those from Indonesia. Uh, so now uh, introduce uh, uh, Fabrizio Conti, John Cab University, translates and spiritual journeys in comparative historical perspective, the case of witchcraft. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for organizing this and for uh, allowing me to present here with you. Um, 
so the uh, the title of my presentation of my paper is trans states and spiritual journeys in comparative historical perspective the case of witchcraft so um, it's about 15th century italy anyway so not contemporary things so the 15th century milanese franciscan preacher uh, bernardino busti in his own sermons and this is the sermon number 16 uh, of his own uh, collection of sermons uh, titled Rosarium Sermonum and a certain points writes about and this is uh, the excerpt that I'm going to read so he writes what occurred in the territory of uh, Ivrea northern Italy where a certain girl was often often urged, urged by uh, a diabolical little old lady to go with her to the game of Diana is a name for the gathering of uh, uh, alleged witches after she had once said to her that she had never seen nor experienced such delights and at last agreed to go when the old lady told her that in order to participate in those sites and pleasures she would have to renounce the christian faith baptism and the uh, sacraments of the church she did all that thus while she was in a certain field suddenly it seemed that she had been taken to a wonderful whole covered with silk and filled with pleasant fragrances and in that place it seemed that there were wonderful young men dressed in golden and silver clothing dancing with women participating in the same game and likewise beautiful women frolicking with the men and that sounds of sweet singing were to be heard but when the young uh, uh, girl uh, herself uh, began to join in uh, she was a little old uh, uh, lady all decrypted, um, uh, bent and twisted, cavorting, and after the dance, wanting to do disgusting things with a young man. So the young girl sees all that taking place there at that gathering. Uh, the girl was astonished at this and began to yell, saying, Oh, Jesus. And suddenly the illusion uh, completely disappeared and she found herself in the same place in the field as she told her confessor afterwards. So this is the description of, a, of an illusion, probably dreamlike experience. So the, uh, this is the end of, uh, of that text. Uh, so the wicked old uh, woman, the wicked old woman inciting the young girl to take part in the game, the so-called game, the gathering, is uh, one of those uh, vetule or little old women who changed uh, the ancient uh, good fairies of medieval tradition into the consistent stereotype of witches engaged in a ludus or a game that is basically an occasion for announcing Christian faith. The sudden disappearance of uh, uh, that gathering itself with all the dancing and delirious jubilation just after the girl had shouted the name of Jesus signals that all of it was a demonic illusion this element was present uh, in trials too uh, though not describing situation situations uh, um, thought to be illusory uttering uh, the name of jesus was banished from the gatherings of uh, uh, two women uh, who were accused of being witches in the 14th century sibylla and chiarina in milan uh, so as not to offend their own lady of the game, so-called the Madonna Oriente, that was her name, at Venegono, northern Italy, uh, the supposed witches confessed their participation at similar venues uh, in the Silva Rupta region, uh, where they had sexual contact with their demonic lovers and the invocation of Jesus was in fact forbidden. Farter, uh, the preacher that I referred to, Bernardino Busti, a representation of the Ludus Diane seems to evoke, at least partially, the image of the Sabbath that was being fashioned in the trials with, uh, with such emphasis on its uh, reality. At Gambasca, the uh, village of Gambasca, today in the Piemonte region, Caterina Bonivarda confessed to having seen her accomplices uh, and many other people dancing with demons and uh, desecrating the cross on the shores of the Po River. In Valcamonica, the heretic beasts, uh, as the witches and their followers uh, were called, were set together on top of the Mount Tonale, where they uh, have sexual intercourse and dance, that is the accusation. 
as well as uh, to cause ruin uh, to children, cattle, crops by using a kind of magic, magical powder. The tale by the preacher that I refer to invites one to wonder about what should be considered illusion and what reality. The scholar, the American professor Walter Stephens, uh, has pointed out that, uh, quote, a closer look shows that the crucial distinction is not between truth and falsehood eh, or between uh, waking and dreaming, but rather between body and spirit, end quote. Body and spirit, however, had their specific nature within scholastic theology and were both considered as equally real, both of them. Dreams also uh, would seem to offer the example of something that really happens, although not in a physical and nor in a spiritual form. We are aware, after all, uh, that during certain phases of sleep, the brain is in a similar, uh, in, a, in a state similar to wakefulness. Yet, this is probably the domain of illusion uh, within which Milanese Franciscan preachers, uh, like Bernardino Busti, confine certain witch beliefs. The skeptical view of the friars was simply based on the grounds that this phenomena did not occur, certainly not physically, but not even spiritually, being just dreamlike uh, experiences, mere illusions of the mind inspired, according to them, by the devil. The 14th century Florentine uh, Dominican uh, friar, Jacopo Passavanti, uh, his description of those who believe they roam about the night, uh, uh, gathering, uh, so, sorry, they roam about at night at the gathering called Tregenda, as uh, uh, deluded by dreams, uh, exemplifies this type of approach very well. The famous uh, image of the Dominican uh, friar Johannes Nieder, the German Dominican uh, Johannes Nieder, uh, Vetula Dementata, or crazy old little uh, uh, woman, whose supposed flight uh, was probed an illusion by another Dominican friar, observing her remaining motionless while she was convinced uh, that she was actually riding with uh, Diana. So that case is uh, illustrative of the same approach, although in this case, the hypothesis of a, uh, of a real trance state can be considered alongside a dream in the strict sense, given that uh, the witch uh, had anointed herself before engaging in, uh, in such an experience. Ludus related uh, beliefs, so the Sabbath related beliefs uh, and the idea of the Sabbath itself, especially, have been seen as part of a broader background of cultural traditions extending to a pan-European uh, level. Behind the different types uh, of night-goers that the preachers condemned as illusion, one can glimpse uh, the, occurrence, the occurrence of trance states, vision-like experiences, uh, or ecstatic soul journeys uh, that may recall uh, a variety of proximate cultural patterns. This range from spiritual possession and uh, as analyzed by Nancy Cassiola through the shamanistic uh, substratum hypothesized by Carlo Ginzburg uh, involving uh, either male fertility rituals as in the case of the Friulian Benandanti or the Hungarian Taltos or the female attitude towards communicating with the dead to the ambivalent fairy mythologies studied by Eva Poch and the specific popular vision narratives traced by uh, Gabor Klangitzai. Further elements such as animal metamorphosis and witches night flights, especially when the employment of wooden poles and ointments are concerned, seem to acquire real significance uh, when seen as shamanistic traits. Nevertheless, uh, we have been cautioned that even when traceable such some shamanistic traces have to be rather uh, recognized uh, as the disembodied fragments of uh, multifaceted structures conflating with the belief system of witchcraft. So it's a rather complex image. One may even wonder whether tales of soul journeys or flights to the other world, like those performed by the Benandanti and the Donne di Fuori, or uh, described against the background of the multi-form uh, uh, mythology connected to the Ludus Diane may recall what medical science uh, calls a near-death experience. Uh, the analogies between uh, this set of occurrences and what we find in tales of out-of-body experiences 
uh, in folklore and witchcraft related accounts may suggest the possibility of parallelism, a parallelism that however should probably re be referred to uh, the vast domain of vision experience at large. If this is about a trans or quasi trans experience and we know uh, how anthropologists such as Andras uh, Zempleni oppose uh, these to the possession experience, uh, one could still uh, uh, to some extent think about both of this phenomenon as two sides of the same coin. Busti's tale is even somewhat uh, reminiscent of the Franciscan preacher Bernardino da Siena's story of the page of a cardinal who traveling from Rome to Benevento, southern Italy, came across a nocturnal gathering of people dancing on, the, uh, on a threshing floor. According to uh, Bernardino's tale, uh, the cardinal joined those people and in the end, as the assembly vanished upon the arri arrival of the dawn, he took home with him for three years a nice girl from Schiavonia, Sclavonia, who remained speechless all the time. On the uh, one hand, beyond the ideas uh, of Busti's illusory, joyful, uh, but also lustful, an anti-Christian uh, ludus or gathering of those people, and more generally beyond the Sabbath stereotype, there can be traced also the echoes of nocturnal dances or ritual feasts to be found in the countryside. As William de Blecourt has pointed out, a balance must be found between illusion and historical reality. Because according to him, to reduce the Sabbath to the to delirium, dreams, or the product of a, a, a dream-like states, ultimately amounts to abandoning history altogether. So it's important to find the, the historical type of reality behind those uh, tales. The existence of possible roots in social reality that may have contributed to inspire Sabbath stories as therefore to be borne in mind. In this regard, uh, we may think of the extensive distribution of popular assemblies, festivities, uh, and uh, practices, uh, which could easily end up in various types of excesses, perhaps even things with political or religious significance. Um, the juridical and theological autoritates employed by the preachers, by Busti and uh, his other confrères to refute the belief in the reality of such phenomena exemplify the set of sources generally employed by the majority of the preachers in that century of uh, the later medieval period. The basic trait is that uh, the predominance of the Augustinian stance on the matter. Augustine had uh, mentioned the strange metamorphosis of man in his city of God, referring to Circe transforming Ulysses' companions into pigs. And he pointed to the ritual transformation of the Arcadians into wolves, the former narrated in the Odyssey, the latter by Ovid. The preachers rely on Augustine's convictions that not, uh, not even demons can work the transformation of human and uh, of human soul and the body. God could certainly perform everything, Augustine says, but demons can only produce illusions. At this point, the Bishop of Hippo, Augustine, makes things more complicated, pointing to something that Busti does not consider here, but which was to become important. Augustine explains, in fact, how metamorphosized persons may show up uh, in the form of dreamlike images appearing to persons while they are sleeping or in conditions that are much deeper than sleep, resembling trance states. These unreal images may uh, may make them appear to other people as though transformed into the shape of animals, even apparently carrying loads, which according to Augustine can in fact sometimes be real. In this case, the loads are carried by demons in order to make the deceits more realistic. Demons can thus produce only illusory images of human uh, metamorphosis, uh, but can carry real objects according to Augustine. San Augustine. The same uh, uh, skeptical view uh, that, is, that is represented well by St. Augustine is uh, reconsidered uh, uh, in the uh, canon uh, nec mirum of the Decredum Graziani, whose text is also attributed to Augustine in that case. According to this canon to which Busti and other Franciscan friars refer, the famous case of the Witch of Endor, 
who summoned Samuel at the request of King Saul, clearly shows that the magic art is simply deception, since she had summoned a demon and not the soul of the prophet. Reference to Thomas Aquinas, who still elaborates on Augustine, reinforces the idea that demons can operate marvelous works that are, however, illusory. Clearly behind the issue of metamorphosis, the main concern of this text is to put demons in their place, a place that in no way should impair God's omnipotence. In this sermon, uh, in this sermon 45, uh, uh, um, another, a different uh, Milan is Franciscan friar and preacher, Antonio of Vercelli, explains how all those opposed divine cult and Christian faith who firmly believe that any woman, sorcerer or witch, can really transform into a mouser, a cat or a feline. So three different types of the same type of animal. In this passage, uh, Antonio refers immediately to two core elements. First, he identifies the women, the women with those who are generally believed to shape shift, among whom he uh, lists the type of which called the striga. Second, he points out uh, uh, how the animal into which these women are believed to change shape is a female cat. And uh, uh, not to be mistaken, he mentions three equivalent terms denoting that uh, type of animal. Murilek and Musipola, which refer to the nature of a cat as a hunter of uh, mice, and Gatta, which refers to her nature as a catcher. Clearly, the uh, varied roots of folkloric and literary origin traceable behind the belief in human metamorphosis, which has been seen as a paradigm of the journeys of the soul, were uh, by that time obscured by a mythology centered on female witches metamorphosizing into cats and bewitching people. This is a clear sign of the demonization of those ancient roots, including also uh, the element of flight. And the ensuing picture is one that uh, the friars seek to dispel. To conclude, all these examples, uh, which derive both from the pastoral literature uh, of the friars uh, that I've mentioned, and from some trial cases, uh, um, so from some juridical cases, uh, could, in my opinion, en encourage a reconsideration of Carlo Ginzburg's uh, famous thesis. Uh, uh, ideas uh, about the presence of shamanism related cultural substrata in the ripples of the long duration in Western cultural history regarding uh, the development of which beliefs. Um, this paper, um, uh, in the end, aimed to reconstruct possible hints uh, at the presence of such cultural substrata and, and how they were integrated at various levels into the dominant culture of the time uh, in 15th century uh, Italy. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrizio, for bringing this uh, historical perspective into the discussion. We will have a Q&A later. So uh, now I'll call the next speaker. Akin Mayowa, Akin Otiko, Institute of African and Diaspora Studies, uh, Unilaga ACC. And the paper uh, is titled Ori, Ori Inu, The Inner Person, The Diagnostic and Prescription Tools in Yoruba Traditional Medicine. And uh, our next speaker will be online. Can you? Okay, thank you very much. Would I be able to share my screen? Yes, I yeah. think so. Okay. All right, so that is good for me. Good, nice presentations so far. Um, as has been said in the introduction, my name is Akimayowa Akiyotiko. I uh, do research in the Institute of African and Diaspora Studies, University of Lagos. Uh, my part area of interest is religion and traditional medicine. I There's a daily improvement. My interest to traditional medicine is because there's a daily improvement in the healthcare system and the natural healthcare, whereas there's a daily 
disappointment and daily failure that we see in Western method of healthcare when it comes to some certain disease typologies. And so in the last 13 years, what I have done is to do some research among practitioners of traditional medicine and particularly the Yoruba practitioners. Um, they are grouped, they can be grouped into four four levels. So I I have been spending time with the highest level, and these are the ones that they call the I think there is a connection problem. Yeah, his screen froze. Emily, maybe if you interrupt him, he could start it again. I think the connection just went down. We can see if he's going to reconnect. Otherwise, we pass to the next speaker. Casino. Okay, so maybe um, I'll call the next speaker and then we can go back uh, and I hope that it, it can connect back. So our next speaker is uh, Geraldine Mossier and, uh, uh, her paper, uh, her from the Université de Montréal. And uh, her paper is titled um, The Scope and Limits of Effective Technologies, the Case of Core Energetic Session Groups. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Emily. I'm so sorry for my colleague, uh, Akin Mayova. I hope he can join us later so that we can hear him. Uh, I also want to thank the organizers of this uh, beautiful event, and I wish I, I were with you in Roma instead of rainy Montreal. Um, so I'll start by saying by, uh, that uh, in Western countries, therapeutic pluralism is usually bound, bounded by local legal regulation which tends to draw a strict line between legitimate biomedical institutions and informal underground practices, which are nevertheless often mobilized by patients for lack of access to biomedical infrastructure or for lack of success of these infrastructures to answer their needs when physical or psychological disease also encompass existential questions. So in this context, alternative therapeutic practices often draw their legitimacy and credibility on their ability to subtly tie the metaphors of personal transformation with some elements of scientific knowledge. And this is the care of this is the case of core energetics, a practice that is situated at the junction of these two worlds. Core energetics emerged in the late 60s from the field of psychology, all the while having never been recognized by my, by biomedical spheres uh, and was then relegated to underground world where it later took a spiritual flavor. So in this presentation, I first describe core energetics group sessions and will show how emotions are worked in order to move individual and collective energy and reach an experience of catharsis that is conducive to a specific sense of awareness. And as this work is based on what the Anthony call affective technologies, I will argue that these technologies constrain and bound the experience of awareness into the limits of authorized definitions. 
So this presentation is based on ethnographic fieldwork that I have conducted since early 2022, with weekly participating observations and informal and uh, formal interviews with practitioners and members. I need to emphasize that I come from another background that is more into daily, a mix of daily yogic and meditative practices uh, and embodied practices. And these practices work on bodily sensations as a way to pinpoint biographical experiences that needs to be addressed under the assumption that emotions are temporary and shall pass. So no attachments. So this training allowed me to compare core energetics uh, work on emotion and awareness with other training and other avenues while sharing the same goal. So what is core energetics? Um, so the website of the Institute of Core Energetics in Montreal gives a very clear and comprehensive uh, description of core energetics. It is an evolutionary and creative process of transformation focused on opening the heart, the body and mind. It was developed as a way of facing lifestyle daily challenges by increasing our capacity to love and feel. Using various body techniques and exercises to circulate energy in the body, as well as by basic spiritual principles such as presence and welcoming the present moment, the core energetics approach enables to reconnect uh, with our inner experience and realign with the best of ourselves. So indeed, core energetics is actually based uh, on bioenergy that can be the best described as a mind-body energy approach that has been created in the US by Alexander Leuven, a student of Wilhelm Reich, himself a student of Freud. So as such, it stems from the Freudian psychoanalytic tradition, but has never been recognized or accepted in psychoanalytic circles. This approach focuses on releasing psychological and physical tensions, restoring clients' ability to feel and express, that is what they call their aliveness. In this scheme, the role of the group is central in that it acts as a container, a safe container, where the members project onto each other what they experience in their everyday social relationships. For example, if the presence of another participant, participant triggers a feeling of fear in me, I would express this feeling either verbally or through physical action, such as hiding behind a mattress, for example. So a whole series uh, of tools and accessories are available in this regard, and I put uh, some pictures of this. So this type of expression is meant to release repressed emotions, which allows the energy previously blocked to circulate freely and lead the person to reach a sense of awareness. The, the effect of this cathartic, so I don't speak about possession, but more about the cathartic experience, is then integrated in the body with the help of the group that physically supports and comforts the person with warm hugs. So Pierre Acos, John Pierre Acos, who worked with Leuven to build bioenergy, added a spiritual dimension to bioenergy when he integrated the spiritual teachings that Eva Pierre Acos, actually his wife, received through channeling and which she collated in a book entitled The Pathwork for Self-Transformation, with themes like the connection between ego and universal consciousness, for example. So core energetic, energetic, energetic sorry, is born out of all Psychiatry, Reich, Bioanalytics, Eva's Guide, and Pathwork. So here I would like to, to invite you to see a, a little documentary uh, that uh, depicts a, bit, a little bit this practice. Maybe, Emily, if you want to, to share the, the YouTube uh, video, please. Hello, can you hear me, Emily? Yes, I'm just uh, searching. Okay, video. thank you. If you're feeling something, it's important for the whole group. I want people to believe in what you're feeling. I don't care if what you're feeling is completely different from what everybody else is feeling. Let yourselves really start being 
alive in this process and letting it take you where it wants to go. I think this is stupid. I feel like I'm being tricked. Could you just hit? <laughs> That's what I'm supposed to do as a man, right? Get mad and hit? I don't know. I don't either. I just feel like, why, why, what's all this? Why do we have? I'm totally willing to trust, to go with this process. I just don't get it. Tell me what I'm supposed to do, and I'll do it. Why am I hitting? I don't know if I can last a week. I'm here in my own fucking way. Don't fucking tell me how to be here. It's a little weird. Why can't we just say we're honest with who we are, we're not ashamed of what we are, why can't we just be brave right now? You scare me, and I have men issues, serious men issues. <laughs> fucking hard. Show up for life, man. Show up for life. Right here. Fuck you! Fuck you! Fuck you! This world's fucked up. We live in a fucked up world, man. This is gnarly. And to me, the sanity is this. Not just this, but it's healing. It's healing people's hearts. Good. Look at each other. Bend your knees. And notice what you're aware of in this moment. <laughs> Look around the room. Look at people. Look what you're doing to them. Look how you're affecting people. It's about freedom. It's about freedom. Thank you, Emily, for sharing your screen. So, um, so how do uh, the session, the, the group session work? Uh, I will describe a little bit the ritual. The, the session Hello, and welcome again to Conscious TV. My name is Ian McNay. Oh. And okay. today our guest uh, is Richard Moss. And Rick Thank you. So, so uh, typically the session groups follow the different stages that John Pierre Eco deline delineated around three evolutionary stages that in some ways echo Van Gennep's uh, steps uh, of the rite of passage. So the first uh, stage is the penetration of the mask, which consists in getting in touch with the false ideals and beliefs inherited from childhood and ad adaptations that the individual believed necessary to survive when he, when he or she was young. So this is the phase of warming up. Up, dancing, expressing oneself vocally, physically, get in touch with one, how one feels in small groups of two or three. Then comes the second stage, which is the confrontation and transformation of the lower self, which is done through what is called processing, which makes the energy move around the emotions that are experienced. This is done creatively, but most often by tapping on a cube with a bataka with box or gloves, uh, with, with box gloves, sorry. Uh, so the third stage, so, so this is when you tap on the on the bataka. Oh, sorry. Um, and the third stage would be uh, the purification, the integration into the higher self, which consists of embodying our fundamental essence. I take the the, the cornergetics founder uh, words and fulfilling our life task. This leads to a phase of integration through physical support of the group through hugs, leanings over, a lot of physical touch. So Pierre Acosta thought that this was the work we came here to do. The goal of this work is actually to open the core to a new awareness of how the body, emotions, mind, will, and spirit form a unity. So uh, the specificity of this ritual is that it relies on the ability of the participants to raise emotions and to feel. So success in this endeavor is anything but certain, as more than often participants resist the process. Many of them actually talk about quitting the group, which is a lingering thing, a lingering thing in the group session, but at the same time, they desperate, desperately scream and tap, I do not want to feel, I do not want to feel, which paradoxically raises emotions and reaches the goal. 
So here it is not just to feel, but to pay attention to the way you feel. It's, a, it's like a, a self-conscious awareness of feeling. So interactions uh, with one another uh, are central uh, in this endeavor to make emotions move, uh, especially when each one triggers the emotion of one another. So then uh, from that point, one person would start a process where members of the group would play roles. One member can play the role of, of a spouse, of a parent, of a son, to make the person process emotions. Then the leader would suggest step by step. Uh, for example, once uh, the participant has reached personal deep anger, the leader would propose to go one step further. Do you want to go one, st one step further? How do you feel? What do you feel? Is it comfortable or not? So when the participant says no, then he or she is invited to tap or, or do anything to release emotions like lying on the mat and tapping with legs very fast like a child tantrum, for example. So gradually, the participant retreats all their emotion, uh, fear, grief, and then peace for a sense of relief. So importantly, the leader and the rest of the group are not passive. They support the process either by triggering, triggering it or by physically supporting the participant's process, usually by wrapping their arms around them with affection. The leader himself holds people in his arm. So this is meant to embody awareness in the physical tissue than in, in the flesh. So it happens a few times that for a person who experienced the grief of a recent sentimental breakup, the whole group gathered to hold the person up to show support. And this moment was highly ritualized with gentle music and softened light. So... Um, so the leader accompanies the process uh, by framing the experience in words, thereby objectifying the experience, but rarely does he re-symbolize re the experience. Uh, and most participants express relief after the session, yet a few of them also express dissatisfaction for feeling unachieved, like, I feel now, what do I do with that now? Others come back to the following session group expressing disappointment as the relief they uh, experienced during the ritual had no concrete impacts on their everyday life afterwards. So here uh, I would like to, to approach uh, these session groups and the role of emotion through, um, through the notion of uh, affective technologies that was introduced by uh, D'Antoni, who talks about affective technologies that elicit specific feelings and enable the formation of new affective assemblage. And also the affective technologies allow for disassemble existing emotional assemblage by means of enabling processes of detachment. So uh, in, the, in this section groups, the, the, the groups aim at moving emotions to reach energy and awareness, and it also aims at deconstructing rules and norms that are attached to these emotions, what they call the beliefs in the basic sense of non-evidence-based uh, convictions. Sorry. So the deconstruction of meaning goes through a typical process of creating a liminal and chaotic space before a state of emotional reintegration and appeasement. So this is not to say that there are no social rules, like you always have to ask the consent of the other participant before uh, having physical contact, and you can only express your emotions on cube. You, I mean, physical violence one to the other is not allowed, of course. Uh, yet verbal interactions are sometimes rough and not filtered, like when someone bobs up toward another one and screams the powerful no. So um, how is this effort of deconstruction of beliefs attached to emotions and how the release of energy are conducted? I think here the notion of catharsis is quite helpful, especially uh, in, the, in the meaning of the in Greek phil philosophy, where uh, it is understood in the sense of clear Clearing, purifying, and purging. And for Aristotle, for example, this cathartic experience is based on Greek tragedy when participants identify to the character's emotions and thereby uh, release and get through them. So, uh, of course, the term uh, has been uh, now used, is, is now used uh, more in this psychoanalytical circles, where it deals with the awareness by which a subject remembers a past traumatic event, relieves it, and then overcomes it. So cathartic is, is that the process, sometimes emotionally violent, for which the subject frees himself from repression. So, of course, there are many things to, to, to say, but I see that the time is flying. How, how, how much time do I still have, Emily? Okay. 
Okay. So I will go on. Um, so then uh, the ritual, I, I, I still want to talk about the rituals inter interactions. Uh, here I draw on the work of uh, Espiritu Santo, who talks of the ritualized interactions for the emergence of socialized feelings that build a sense of belonging and make the group. And indeed, in core energetics, building the group is really central uh, in that it is, uh, it, it's nearly an organic entity, the group. So because it, it's in the group space uh, that members can express their own vulnerability. And it is also the group that allows integration. There is so there is this play of recognition and each of each one other's uh, emotions. So this is why the stability of the group and the bounds members can create are not only important but unavoidable. So therefore, the rules of going in and out of the groups are very strict. Strict, sorry. So if someone wants to join the group, he he or she has to commit to eight weeks participation at least. And then you have to pay each session group, even if you're not present. So it comes to about 65 US dollars each time, each, um, uh, each group. And then if you want to leave the group, you have to warn the, the, the group two weeks before leaving so, th so that the group has the time to make a proper uh, farewell ritual. So I would like to finish by uh, emphasizing maybe uh, the, the limits also of those te uh, affective technology. And here I want to borrow the concept of education of attention from Tim Ingold and to adapt it to uh, a new concept of education of emotions. Uh, because uh, of course, in this um, in these session groups, the, 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 there is a limited emotional repertoire to which the processes uh, eventually come to. Uh, so there are four basic emotions that are uh, the, to which the, the, the process come back. Uh, it's fear, anger, sadness, and, and joy. So, um, so those, those emotions would be hardly contextualized. Uh, very rarely the expression of emotions comes with explanation of the context. I would say I'm fed up with my partner, but nothing more. And, uh, and so this, uh, this raises the uh, question of uh, the un un question assumption of a psychic unity, where eventually any experience of fear would be reduced to level rage, or sorry, any, sorry, excuse me, any experience of anger would be reduced to level rage, or any experience of fear would be reduced to the fear of um, of, of death. Um, so this raises also the question of the cross-cultural uh, dimension of this technology uh, of affection, of this affective technology, where uh, most of the persons in those groups are from Western background, but there are also minorities from Asia and African people um, groups who do not really identify with this style of expressing emotion that is really extrovert. Um, I would like to finish by questioning also the role or the place of contestation, because of course there is con contestation in this uh, kind of group, especially when, when you have to pay for a group that you didn't attend, so people would question this, these roles, and, and uh, actually when there is contest contestation, uh, the leader would uh, negotiate the contestation by coming back to the three principles, and especially the first one, where you have to take 100% of your responsibility to what happens. So, for example, if I would say, I'm not comfortable with pain if I do not come, the leader would tell me, okay, how do you feel about it? Do you want to process your frustration or your anger towards me? So the, the, the contestation would be uh, um, uh, thrown back to the, to the person as, as a mirror. Uh, so uh, I think I'm going to end my presentation now with a conclusion for a research age agenda, because this is, of course, a work in progress. And here I would like to draw on uh, the invitation of Arnaud Alloy, who talked about the project of exploring process of learning possession, and in my case, catharsis, by focusing on the psychosocial social mechanisms, interrelations of cultural and psychological elements, and especially emotion, cognition, and attention attention. So this could be this project could be applied in the case of catharsis for this um for this uh field work. And I also want to question the role of anthropologists in such field work, how to capture this sort of rituals that precisely aims at getting beyond meaning and symbols. Thank you. Thank you, Geraldine. Anna we can now see if uh, Akim, Akim Maiwa can... All right. Uh, yes, thank you. 
I go I go back. I go back. See, sorry, sorry about the break. Mission. I'm just gonna go on to the slide I was on, and that's the slide. Um okay. It seems that there is a connection okay. problem, but let's see how it goes with a slide share. Okay. Can you see the slide? We can see the slide. I yeah. think so. Okay. All right. All right. So, like I said, my background, and I've done this research in the last thirteen years, spending time with those they call Babalawus. They are the highest. They are the highest level of traditional practitioner in medical healthcare among the Yorubas. And I'm pretty much focusing on Nigeria. And like I said about my interest, um, there is a growing development in healthcare, but there's a, also the growing dissatisfaction in some typology of some disease that Western medicine cannot receive. And that's the focus. So basically, I'm looking at treatment for human beings. And if you look at the definition that Ido gave as to human beings, there are two aspects of, um, of a human person. You have the ara, which is the physical body. And then you have the emi, which is the spiritual aspect of the body. Now, there is an aspect that transcends um, emi. When it comes to healthcare, there are three areas that can be afflicted. You can get affliction on the physical body, and there can be affliction on the spiritual aspect, but there is also what is called the anyomo, the destiny, and that also can be affected. And that is where the essence of my presentation lies, where um, the individual gets affected and the all right um, so to be able to access to be able to respond to treatment and to be able to diagnose of the more I am more the so in the Yoruba, what there is a level of there's what is known as disease diagnosis, and there Foster and Anderson, Jagede, myself, we all agree on the fact Sorry, that diseases, there. ailment. There is a connection problem, so um, perhaps if you switch off your camera while you're using the slides uh, for the moment and then come back for the discussion with the camera on, because sometimes when you move the slides with the camera on, it might slower the... So either one on, or the other. Okay, all right. And can you, can you okay, make... Okay, so can you hear me now? Bigger? Yeah, if you can make your slides a bit bigger because we have a small screen. Or put it on okay. slide. Um. Uh, on slideshow. Or the bar at the bottom when you can use the, uh, announce the percentage at the bottom. Yep. The better. Uh, if, if you can click uh, the icon on the side or the bottom side. Yeah. Try with the other one near the um slide. Let me. Yeah. Yes. 
That's better. better. Okay, all right. Okay. So sorry yeah. for all of that. So yeah. among the Yorubas, there is an there's an understanding of disease causation, and that is disease the theology that diseases can be caused either by natural or supernatural causes. Supernatural causes can afflict both the body and the ME, whereas natural causes just afflict the ME. And then diagnosis is also possible using the natural causes. And also diagnosis is possible when supernatural means are, are found. So when diagnosis fails at the natural level, then it's presumed that the ailment affects the ME, the supernatural aspect of the individual. That is when the Urinu is engaged. And by Urinu here, I mean the inner person, the inner person. Now, the nature of the inner person is it is the part of that human being that is conscious of every event that concerns the individual, both in the conscious and the unconscious. The conscious events are senses, the physical existence on earth. So the, the conscious body, the physical body just exists, the natural one, the nature of it is just that it exists at the natural level, existence on earth. However, Orinu is that part of the human person that is aware of the events, both the physical and those that are not physical, that have preceded the existence of human beings on earth. So that is why there is a mention of destiny in Yoruba traditional medicine. What you see to the right side of the screen are basic tools that help to engage with the orinu. So here orinu by its nature is that it is that which had existed before human person began to exist here. And so he has a knowledge of the person before, during, and of course, when the person dies. Now, the basic function is that first, it helps to identify the configuration of the person, what the person chose before the physical birth on earth. This is done to, this is done in order to be able to diagnose what is wrong with the person. And so when Urinu is engaged with, it is possible to know what the person chose before birth and if there is a disalignment in the course of existence. And of course, like I had said about the disease etiologies, for disalignment to cause some level of disease at the spiritual level. So there is divination that helps with the original plan of the individual on earth that helps to identify what that plan is. Now, how do you now activate the renal? So I had spoken about different types of diseases. I've talked about the natural caused disease and I've spoken about the spiritually caused diseases. Now, these are the focus of the use of renal. This is diagnosed and activated when one witnesses the process of Ayumon. So what happens is there is the patient is either engaged in the process of divination where the person is taken to a time before the existence on earth. So the questions are asked, and usually the patient is called by the mother's name or the name. There are natural names that come that are indicated the way the child was born. And so if there are natural names, that's how to engage with Orinu. And the person that does that is the divinity of divination, which is Orumila. I 
access and if it is possible to understand what took place before birth, then diagnosis takes place when the person takes place. So Orinu is activated when the patient is engaged either through divination or the patient is put into a process where the patient sleeps and then the name is called. He is summoned to speak about the life experiences. And the patient is able to speak beyond the present in order to be able to diagnose what is happening in the present. So that is it about diagnosis. So there are two ways of engaging Orinu. So the first one is through the normal natural process of um, divination where the individual is told a story and the individual locates his story or her story in the narrative or the individual is summoned through the name, either the name the individual brought or the name of the mother. The alternative to it is to sum the person's name and use the person's name in order to be able to get. Now, what is recommended usually, because Orinu is supposed to take one beyond what is seen. So what is recommended in Yoruba medicine is to, from the beginning when a child is born, to actually do what is called the SNTI, a process of identifying who and what the individual will be on earth. And so that becomes a guide. So the do's and the don'ts are always adhered to in order to be able to identify ailments, derailments, and things that are malfunctioning about the person. So the essence, the essence of this presentation is to let us know the holistic nature of medicine and the need to go beyond what is physical, what is naturally seen. And to also realize that an individual is beyond what the physical entity that is engaged with. So Orinu takes the patients beyond what is seen makes the patient go inwards to be able to tell itself or her story to be able to identify. So the practitioner ignites that inner person patient in order to be able to connect to that so that the story is told. I'd like to thank you all for listening. Um, uh, this this is fascinating to me because it's it's a moment to share something beyond um, regular stories we hear about healthcare system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now I'll introduce Sydney Greenfield, University of Wisconsin, Milwaukee, and uh, Otorino Bombini, Movimento Saúde Mental, Bon Jardin Fortaleza. And the uh, paper is titled Syncretizing Tradition to Heal to Unrelated Indigenous People, the North American Lakota Sioux and the uh, Brazilian Pitaguari. Thank you, Emily. We're going to shift levels of analysis. I'm going to start it with some background and then turn it over to Padre Zino. Much has been written about the wanton destruction and near genocide of indigenous peoples in the Americas who are in the path of expansive European colonial powers. Efforts by specific groups to heal and be revitalized are just beginning to be studied. This paper tells the story of two groups, one in North America and the other on the South American continent that are at different stages on the road to being healed and revitalized. The more advanced Lakota Sioux are collaborating with the Brazilian Pitaguari who have only recently recognized and reasserted themselves. A primary means by which this is happening is the introduction of the Lakota spiritual worldview to the Pitaguari. The South American people are syncretizing it with a reinterpretation of their own history to create something new and viable. 
That this has happened is the story of the remarkable life trajectory and efforts of one of the authors of this paper, Padre Vino Bonvini. Born in Milan, Padre Vino became a medical doctor before he joined the Camboni Missionary Order. In the 1970s, he went to study theology at the Catholic Theological Union. While earning a master's degree, he took a course called, quote, a dialogue between Christian and Lakota spirituality, unquote, taught by a Presbyterian theologian. Part of the requirements for the course was a field trip to the Lakota Sioux Reservation in South Dakota. That trip changed Padre Vino's approach to life and to his work. He learned to think systemically that everything is interrelated. While on the reservation, he began to learn Lakota rituals. Medicine man Adam Little Elk gave him an eagle feather that belonged to his mother and a sacred rock on which to pray in the sweat lodge. These gifts established a bond between the two that led on subsequent, subsequent visits to the Catholic priest being adopted as a member of the tribe and given a Lakota name. Padre Vino's new brother, Adam, spent five years serving as a soldier in Vietnam. He returned with PTSD. His re-entry into the world of Lakota, its rituals and spirituality, he contends, led to his cure. After returning to Italy from the U.S., Padre Vino was ordained a priest. The Cambonis then sent him to be a medical missionary, first in Ecuador, among the indigenous Kayapa, and then to Africa, among the Asholi people in northern Uganda. Wanting to go to Brazil, he convinced his superiors to send him to the station the Cambonis had in Fortaleza. In 1993, he participated in the World Congress of Psychiatry in Rio de Janeiro. While there, he was impressed by a presentation given by Dr. Adalberto Barreto. Barreto, a Brazilian trained medical doctor with European PhDs in both psychiatry and anthropology, explained what he calls community therapy, a form of group therapy in which he convenes up to several hundred people at a time and discusses their individual problems with them. Barreto offered to help Padre Vino use community therapy in his work in the favela of Bon Jardin, where the Camboni mission is located. There, over time, Padre Lino elaborated on the procedure, adding his own therapeutic practices that were influenced heavily by his adoption of the Lakota vision of integrating multiple aspects of healing. His first encounter with the Pitagwari was in 2007. A student in a class he taught with a colleague was employed as a social worker on their reservation. After meeting the chief and with the student's help, he and the psychiatrist anthropologist Antonio Moran Cavalcante introduced the Sing a Vida, Yes to Life program they developed to help teenagers resist illicit drugs introduced by drug gangs. In the process, Padre Vino learned something about the Pitaguari while continuing his mental health work in Bon Jardin and increasing his participation in the life of the Pitaguari. Padre Vino traveled to North America periodically 
to visit his Lakota friends and family and participate in their rituals. He grasped that the Lakota traditional rituals, were, that the Lakota were using the Sundance, the Sweat Lodge, the Vision Quest, and other traditional rituals as part of a project to reimagine their past and embark on a much needed healing process that has them on the road to revitalization. Partial background to this with the activities of the American Indian Movement in challenging the US Bureau of Indian Affairs and conservative Indian agents to give greater autonomy to the Indians. To learn their own traditions, some members of the movement, inspired by the book Black Elk Speaks, went to the Lakota Sioux Reservation in South Dakota, where they met with some of those who had participated in author John Needhart's conversation with the venerable Lakota when he set out specifics of the traditional Lakota rituals and worldview. Native peoples across North America, including the Lakota, in part used Nick Big Elk's teaching to reinterpret and perform their rituals. A central feature of this was the Sundance. A Sundance runs for four days in which the participants fast enter the sweat lodge and pray that they will receive a vision. During this time, most participants, I suggest, enter an altered state of consciousness. When they do, as part of the healing process, immediate early genes are released and earth bodily processes are stimulated, activating their immune endocrine and other biophysiological systems. This facilitates healing on an individual level. The state of consciousness, however, is specific. It is that of their reimagined mythical past in which the participants enter an enchanted universe. In 1953, according to Solins, the German psychiatrist and philosopher Paul Jaspers dubbed the transformation that began some 2,500 years ago the axial age. Quote, the essence of the change that Max Weber referred to as disenchantment, continuing the quote, was the translation of divinity from an imminent presence in human activity to a transcendental other world of its own reality, leaving the earth alone to humans, now free to create their own institutions by their own means and lights, unquote. This is a quote from Solace. Those institutions have not worked for First Nation peoples, nor have they for much of the rest of humanity, leading perhaps to a re-enchantment of the modern world. The enchanted universe of the Lakota Enta during a Sundance is filled with entities, such as the Lakota ancestors, that are believed to be in the world of the believers and to have causal efficacy in their lives. When they participate in the Sundance and enter the enchanted world, the Lakota interact with their ancestors who guide them to imagine and relive in modified form their traditional way of life. This provides the participants with a positive sense of being a Lakota and a guide for their life when the ritual ends. 
while in the altered state, each ritual participant is encouraged to have a vision. In traditional practice that can be used today to envision a future in which the ancestors help the living improve their lives and well-being. Hence, during the intense four days of a Sundance, healing takes place individually and communally, resulting in the participants developing a positive sense of who the Lakota are and how to live today as a member of the tribe. Padre Reno will take it from here to tell you about the Pitsigwadi. Thank you, Sid. Reno. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I would like to introduce also our friend Neto Witko Pitaguari, that is one of the uh, new reality that came uh, from the bridging of the healing circle between the Lakota people and the Pythagorean people. Uh, it was a little kid when we began the experience uh, in 2007, and now is a big leader. <laughs> and he went through a process of formation, and he was inspired by this bridging between the Lakota people and the Pythagorean people. And uh, we can share about this experience briefly, remembering that uh, the healing circle is uh, the medicine wheel of the Lakota people, define anthropologically the human being as a biopsychosocial spiritual being. And then with the Mitakwe Oriasin uh, saying, that means all my relations, we are all related. They began a understanding of life that join the different kind of uh, beings, human, animal, vegetal, mineral, spiritual beings, all related in a quantum physics vision that explain that the Lakota spirituality and cosmology uh, since 12,000 years ago is very deep and, and wise and help us to understand better the importance of the indigenous culture today, as Papa Francisco is saying the encyclical uh, Laudato Si, the importance of recovering the energy, the wisdom, the understanding, and the uh, capacity of uh, planning the future according to the human being of the seventh generation ahead. So we have to think about the future, integrating the, the human with the animal, with the vegetal, with the mother herd, understanding that uh, when we join the cultures, when we join a, a different kind of understanding and point of view about life, we, we are preventing the self-destruction of the planet. And so the, the human uh, being today needs to go back to understand and feel the importance of the natives and the uh, indigenous cultures. I have been studying with uh, some authors like Greenfield uh, that has a, a wonderful text about a spiritual healing in the spirit with scalpels uh, in which he describes the whole kind of different approach uh, that in Brazil we have here, Catholic, evangelical uh, spirits, and then shamanic approaches, uh, 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 among others. And then Kleiman, a, a psychiatrist and anthropologist that, uh, at Harvard University, has been uh, creating the model biopsychosocial. So with the meeting of the healing circle of the Lakota people, it has been clear to me as a Catholic priest the importance of a, a biopsychosocial spiritual approach with the mental health problem, with psychiatry problem, and so developing the ethno-psychiatric approach that uh, lead me to create the community systemic approach that is a social uh, therapy uh, approach that help uh, the people uh, you know, to understand better uh, all the importance of being 
a human being with all his gift or her gifts and all potential that can uh, develop if uh, we develop the internal intelligence, inter interpersonal intelligence, intrapersonal, interpersonal, transpersonal intelligence that lead us to have a systemic approach with life that is the same approach of the Lakota people. And so when the shaman had a dream uh, that so understood that his nephew, Vupila, could become a, a messenger between the Lakota people and the Brazilian Indian uh, tribes, uh, my brother, uh, Adam Lideler, came over met the Pitaguari people, and we began a dialogue between the, the North American Indian people and the South American Indian people. And this is a present because it's present also in the prophecy of Crazyor, Crazyor that was saying that one day all the Indian tribe will come together. And there is a prophecy that says that Eagle of the North and the Condor of the South will get together for his recovering the importance of the uh, native culture for healing in the people, for healing the planet. And so uh, uh, we are seeing, we are observing that uh, for the Pitaguari people, meeting the Lakota culture has been a, a strong way of going back to their own roots and tradition and the uh, rituals, because the genocide, the cultural genocide in Brazil, according to the Pitaguari experience, was total. They lost the language. So my brother, when he came over here, helped them to understand the importance of the language, the importance of the rituals, the importance of being Indian, feeling proud of being themselves, feeling proud of being Pitaguari. And so here we have Wico, Neto Pitaguari that uh, had a new name. My brother gave him a new name, Witko, that uh, in Lakota means crazy, like crazy horse. But why? Because Neto Witko Pitaguari was willing to be himself, was willing to, to be the best. And so the connection between the Lakota and the Pitaguari people helped him to become who is now. And so I would like to share a little space and uh, to let him talk some words because it is important to introduce the people in our academical experiences and say what we are saying that is really what the people want that we say in the academical environment. So please introduce yourself uh, with Go. I will try to translate a little bit from the Portuguese. Bom dia. Olá. Uh, good day. My name is Neto, I'm indigenous Pitaguari. My name is Neto, I'm a Pitaguari a Native American, Brazilian. I'm very happy to be here with you to share our experience. Esse contato com a cultura Lakota e o nosso povo Pitaguari the contact between the uh, Pitaguari people and the Lakota culture <laughs> desde o ano de 2010, since 2010, nós experimentamos e fomos acolhidos eh, nessa irmandade com os Lakotas. We have been welcomed with the Lakota fraternity and uh, welcomed with this uh, culture. E recebemos essa grande missão de continuar preservando a nossa cultura ancestral. And we received the mission to preserve and to recover our ancestral, ancestral culture. Sobretudo, sobretudo através da língua, preservação da língua materna. First of all, uh, recovering the mother language. Então, a sabedoria Lakota, eles falam muito nisso e transmitem isso direto para nós. So, Lakota wisdom is, is sharing and transmitting this power, and they, they do that with us. Porque se você não é capaz de compreender a sua própria língua, você nunca vai saber o que os espíritos estão falando. Because if you don't speak your language, you can't understand what the spirits are saying to you. E a prática desse ritual do INIP e outros que nós experimentamos tem um crescimento muito forte para o nosso povo. E so experience the rituals, the Lakota rituals like the INIP, that is the sweat lodge, has been very powerful for us for understanding better our culture. Principalmente 
pelo fortalecimento da cultura, pelo fortalecimento da espiritualidade. Strengthening the culture and the spirituality. Isso, e também pela questão do próprio crescimento pessoal de várias pessoas da comunidade. E também for the self-growing of the people and of the community. Eu, por exemplo, sou parte dessa experiência que iniciei há 16 anos atrás. I'm part of this experience since 16 years ago. E fruto disso hoje eu trabalho na minha própria comunidade. And now today I am working my community para exatamente manter a cultura e cuidar das pessoas. For uh, uh, conserving and uh, the culture and uh, taking care of the people. E a sabedoria Lakota, eles trazem muito isso, como o tempo que você se doa às pessoas. Lakota Wisdom gives us the understanding that it's the time to serve the people, to take care of the people. Então, quando você pergunta ao Lakota qual é o sentido da vida, qual é o sentido dos rituais. So when you ask to a Lakota what's the meaning, what's the sense of your life or the rituals. Eles sempre respondem, to pray for the people. Né? They, they say, to pray for the people. Rezar pelas pessoas, doar pelas pessoas. To, to offer yourself for the people. Então, é, nesse contexto, a gente ainda tem muito a aprender. So we have a lot of things to, to learn and Uh, yet. Mas o principal é saber que a espiritualidade ela sempre tem que estar presente e a gente sempre está conectado com ela. Mas the most important thing is to be in contact with spirituality, always in contact with spirituality. E que esse contato, que essa experiência, ele faz com que o nosso povo seja mais forte e que a gente se sinta mais fortalecido. So in this contact we can become stronger and our people can be strong. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so this is a little sharing, and now I'm going. I'm going to show you some pictures of the rituals between the, the Lakota and the, the Pitaguari. Uh, I will try to share here the the screen. I hope that is going to work. Can you see it? Not yet. Okay. Yes. Okay. Can you see the picture? Yes. Yes. This is the the young uh, spiritual leader uh, that uh, uh, is the son of the old spiritual leader that uh, unfortunately died recently, Pajé Barbosa, that is a, was a healer. And we were working together for the healing process with the people. So he was going with the all knowledge and wisdom of the Pitaguari spiritual healing power. And then when he uh, understood that it was necessary a connection with the, the white Indian, that is myself, so he was calling me for the medication. So we could, uh, ethno-psychiatry speaking, healing the people, joining the culture, the cosmology, the rituals with the uh, biomedical approach. And this biopsychosocial spiritual approach, of course, it's, it's different because they have the people to be in touch with their own spirituality, their own culture, and also using the medication. And this can help a lot because many people do not want to take medication because are, are out of their own understanding. So joining the two energies, the native culture, spirituality and cosmology with the medicine psychiatry, with the ethno psychiatry approach, we can really help the people to be uh, healed in a different kind of approach with the systemic community approach. So uh, uh, I will try here. <laughs> Sorry, Padre Rino, really? you need to wrap up because you're already over the time. Okay, okay, I understand. I will try to show you some other pictures. Uh, it takes time. Uh, there is one of the Oneto. Apareceu? 
Unfortunately, the internet is is. Can you can you see it? Yes. Can you see it? Yes. Some of the picture of the rituals, <coughs> the gift of the of the profound uh, understanding of spirituality, and uh, you know the way that they have to understand the the sharing of health with the spirituality, with the culture, with the rituals. You know. And this is wonderful. This is the Ritual of the Manguera Sagrada. Neto, can you explain what is the meaning of the Manguera Sagrada for them? É, nós, o povo Pitaguari tem uma Manguera Sagrada. Uh, Pitaguari people has a sacred tree called Manguera, the mango tree. No mês de junho é o mês em que nós vamos lá no dia 12 para festejar. Uh, uh, June 12 is the day for the, uh, the, fest, the feast, for the celebration. Porque lá foi onde nossos indígenas foram escravizados e mortos. Because it's there that the indigenous people were uh, killed and uh, it went to slavery. E aí é o dia que nós voltamos lá para festejar junto com eles e, e relembrar. So we go there for being with them and to remember them and being uh, happy that now we are free. E isso dá cada vez mais a certeza de relembrar as memórias ancestrais. And this is a, a good way to remember the ancestral memories. Então, nós vamos lá para cantar, rezar, dançar, fumar o cachimbo em memória deles que perderam a vida pela manutenção da cultura do nosso povo. So we go there for singing, dancing, smoking the, the circuit pipe, remembering them, being happy of being them that now they are free, and now we are free. E também são ofertadas flores no pé da mangueira para lembrar de todas as, as almas, de todas as pessoas. Que... So we offer, we offer also flowers for the souls and for the people that went through slavery and were killed. So I think that this is our way of understanding the bridging between the Lakota and the Pitaguari people. We thank you for your attention and uh, we are working for overcoming the coloniality syndrome that is internalized uh, among the people that are excluded, the most poor and abandoned people, the native, the black people, the, the Quilombo people that went through the slavery. And so they have in the uh, in unconscious experience something that sometimes block their own uh, uh, way of uh, uh, developing, of being themselves. So through the uh, community systemic approach, they have a chance to know better themselves, to accept themselves, to be proud of who they are, to have a, a self-esteem that is healthy and then to realize their own dreams and their own mission in this world. That is to heal the planet from the, uh, ten the, 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 uh, the self-destruction tendency that unfortunately we can observe uh, in our world. So thank you for your attention and uh, thank you Lakota and Pitaguari people. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing this collaborative experience. Unfortunately, we're running out of time because we need to leave this room and we're starting another session in another room uh, in five minutes. 
<laughs> so um, I think uh, the, the diversity of the perspective that, uh, uh, that uh, in, were included in this panel, uh, they, they draw from uh, um, the uh, reflection on the power on rel of relief and uh, release uh, this cathartic experience, uh, uh, the amusement in possession, uh, this possibility offers by, uh, offered by this uh, spiritual uh, diagnosis and the limits imposed by some uh, uh, medical di diagnostic categor uh, categories. Uh, they reflect this tension between these diagnostic categories. Uh, but I'm sure that tomorrow we can continue this discussion in uh, 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 the um, panels uh, we will be having tomorrow. And now we're going to move uh, to um, uh, Aula Morgan for the book launch of Other Worlds, Other Bodies, uh, Embodied uh, Epistemologies and Ethnographies of Healing. I thank all the participants in this, uh, in this panel. Thank you and join us also tomorrow. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.